working in progress. Well, good evening. We're going to begin our study here uh, with a word of prayer. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we come before you this evening to study together a topic that um, we all should understand, we all should have experienced, but we know that um, it is a work of a lifetime of sanctification. And we know, Lord, that um, there's many ideas that we have heard, that we've accepted, that are not in accordance with the scriptures and with the writings of the spirit of prophecy. And we just pray, Lord, that as we begin this, this study into the three angels' messages and their relationship to righteousness by faith, um, that you can guide and direct us through thy spirit. Help us to understand the things we read, and we pray for those who are participating in these studies or those watching on YouTube, um, that you can bless them. Thank you for hearing our prayer. Thank you for the Sabbath that's coming. And be with us now, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. <clears throat> okay, well, good evening, everyone. And... Uh, I know it's not Sabbath yet, but it will be not in not too long a time. And um, I appreciate everybody coming to these studies. Now, this is a new series, and obviously, all of the scriptures are connected, and we'll be referring to things that we've been doing in the morning studies, as well as to the previous studies on 2030 and the previous study on uh, the presidents of the United States, plus all the other studies that we've done. Now, there is a need that has been expressed to me a number of times by various people um, that we should understand righteousness by faith. Now, we're going to be reading a lot of the spirit of prophecy in these studies. And um, to me, you know, every Adventist should know and understand righteousness by faith. I mean, it's very, very clearly outlined in the spirit of prophecy and in the Bible. And to me, it's, it's part of the first principles of the oracles of God. Um, because without a faith, it's really impossible to approach God. But we know that this happens progressively. Now, one of the the premises that that we're studying here, and I, I put it in the email, is when we have this statement in the spirit of prophecy, which we're going to look at about um, uh, the third angel's message is righteousness by faith in verity, um, that this has often been understood that the third angel's message alone embodies the message of righteousness by faith. But we know that the everlasting gospel is a three-step testing prophetic message that develops and demonstrates two classes of worshipers. More specifically, it's the third angel's message that demonstrates the, those that have experienced righteousness by faith. Now, it doesn't mean that they didn't experience righteousness by faith under the proclamation of the second angel's message or under the proclamation of the first, it's just that it hasn't been demonstrated to the world. So that's my understanding of righteousness by faith is the third angel's message in verity. And it, I think she uses the word sancti or justification by faith is the third angel's message in verity. And because of that, often within Adventism, and in my experience prior to coming into this movement, I never understood the first and second angels' messages. I really didn't know what they were. I couldn't, I couldn't place them. I couldn't tell you what. I mean, I could read them from Revelation chapter 14, but I didn't know their, their place in Adventist history. And that's really what this movement has been about. Um, is the unsealing of the seven thunders, which is really um, a revelation of 
what happened in Millerite history by us experiencing those messages in our history. So this is a basic premise of this movement. For some reason, it's not generally understood. That is, one of the things Jeff had to contend with um, during the time that he had his ministry was people who were claiming that we weren't teaching the third angel's message. We weren't teaching righteousness by faith. And Jeff was, if I could characterize this way, annoyed by this claim because the whole message was based upon the first, second, and third angel's messages. And, and Jeff had been through the history in the 1980s and 90s uh, addressing um, the understanding that was being renewed in that history, specifically uh, once you get into the 90s. I mean, it, it always was kind of there, but the 90s sort of brought it to a head. And these were issues over the nature of Christ, um, over what uh, justification, sanctification, uh, glorification, what these things meant, the definitions of the, some of these words. Also, of course, what happened in 1888 and what the 1888 message was. And so this has been something that uh, Jeff experienced, just as, as anybody living, any Adventist living through that time would have known about these issues. Now, um, the fact that this movement was then repeating the history of the first and second angel's message um, wasn't necessarily understood completely. That is, we had this statement in this movement, and many of you will remember this, um, you know, sort of being said this, that, um, that we're repeating Millerite history to the very letter. That would be how it would be worded. And Ellen White doesn't quite say that. What she says is the parable of the ten virgins has been fulfilled and will be fulfilled to the very letter. So when she defines uh, the parable of the ten virgins, she actually is talking about the first and second angels' messages, and she doesn't include the third other than its arrival at the end. And we will see that as we go through some of these. Uh, there's a couple of illustrations that Ellen White has of Millerite history, um, and also some other statements that we're very familiar with. So that's what we're going to go through. Now, um, how how this is what direction this is going to take as we uh, continue our studies? I haven't really mapped it out. I've I've given us a starting point. Um, I, in the email, I sent the Three Angels Messages source book, which many of you already have, uh, but just so that people could, could have it handy. And we're going to read some things in there as we start to delve into this. The focus, though, in this study is more on the message of righteousness by faith rather than on some of the things, because we know about the lines. So obviously, we're going to reference them. Um, and in our understanding of the lines that we're doing in the morning studies, um, you know, we're, we're addressing all of those points. But it's the message of righteousness by faith and how it's connected to all three of these messages um, that I think is something that's quite profound, but also needed at the present time. That is, this movement needs to be looking at how righteousness by faith or justification by faith is connected to uh, the proclamation of the messages um, in Millerite history and how it's connected to this fulfillment of the parable of the ten virgins, the first and second angels' messages in our history. So we, we've, we've touched on these things from a number of different angles, but this one's going to be uh, more focusing upon righteousness by faith and what it is and how it's related to the, to what's happened in the movement, what's happened in Millerite history and Adventist history, but specifically what's happening now. So we're going to look at these statements, these ones we're very familiar with, um, but we need to look at them again. And sometimes when we look at these familiar statements, 
in the context of what God has been unfolding to us, there are things that are going to strike us um, a little differently, details that we're going to notice that we hadn't noticed before. So this first statement from Manuscript 32, 1896, and it can be found other places. Um, Sister White says, the proclamation of the first, second, and third angels' messages has been located by the word of inspiration. Not a peg or pin is to be removed. No human authority has any more right to change the location of these messages than to substitute the New Testament for the Old. The Old Testament is the gospel in figures and symbols. The New Testament is the substance. So uh, I'm going to ask questions as we go along here, and, and people want to answer them. That uh, would be appreciated. Um, so one of the things I, I would ask is, why is it important to know the location of these messages? And why is this compared to the substitution of the New Testament for the old? That if we're going to uh, change the location of these messages, why would that be analogous to substituting the New Testament for the old? What, what does she mean here? I know you have to jump into this um, without a lot of forethought, but anybody have any thoughts on this? Okay, what's the peg or pin? Let's answer that question. Okay, way marks or events. Okay, so these are way marks. They, they mark a path. And I remember uh, backpacking in a snowstorm over uh, a ridge on the Continental Divide, the Great Divide, and um, I really couldn't see too much uh, except going over the ridge, there was these little pegs or pins sticking out of the ground just uh, a few inches, and without those, I would have ended up in completely the wrong location. So I needed these, these pegs or posts or pins um, to guide me. And so these are way marks along the path. Now, what would the, the change of the location of these messages do then? Be disoriented. Okay. Can anyone, um, I, I heard uh, kind of two voices. Chris, did you have a comment on that? Oh, I, I was just going to say, it would seem to me you'd essentially be lost because you don't have those pegs or pins to help show you the way. Yeah, so we're going so we're going to leave the path, right? We need these these messages, and and of course they've been located in the past, so this would be another indication that. In order to, to repeat this history, we're using the pegs or the pins that have been placed there in the past to guide us in this repeat of history. This movement is guided by the template that we have of Millerite history, correct? Yeah, I would say so. That's what I was thinking. Yeah, and this was something really clearly presented from by Jeff from the beginning. And now a thing that was interesting that happened, um, as new light came, that is, as we were walking along the path with the light of the midnight cry shining from the past, and we were unsealing the seven thunders, many people stepped off of the path. Now, why did they do that? And, and often when they, they stepped off the path, 
they would say that Jeff was removing the landmarks or the waymarks. So what was happening there? I know that's kind of a broad question. Why were people leaving when new light unfolded? Could you repeat your question, please? Okay. So as as light unfolded, as we came to understand Millerite history, more right. clearly, people at, at every step of the way, when this new light would come, there would always be people who would step off the path. They would leave the movement. And and their their reason for doing so always was in some way or other, but often stated directly that Jeff was removing the landmarks or moving the landmarks. So why did they think that was happening? Now, Ran in the chat says it was because there was a rejection of light, but the question is why? I like the fields red. Well, in a lot of those cases, what was happening is it wasn't so much a, a moving or removing of the landmarks. It was touching on long held idols that they really didn't want to have brought out. Okay. So they had actually a misunderstanding of Millerite history. Yes. So the light was shining. And so you're going along a path and a person has a, has a particular view about Millerite history and the light comes and it shines on the path and it shows us this this way mark that we had never seen before and people will say no somebody must have moved it it's not where it should be right and and that's what was happening and it's because it's a rejection of but Ellen White says that if you reject new light you actually never understood the old light. Well, in that situation, when, when Mrs. White came to Minneapolis in 1888, mm -hmm. there was a conception by the leadership of the church at that time that she was going to rebuke Jones and Wagner. Mm -hmm. Yet when they came and they gave their presentation, she not only heartily endorsed Jones and Wagner, she noted the issues that had arisen within the church that were completely antithetical mm -hmm. to righteousness by faith. Right. Yeah. And so she now heard from the lips of Jones and Wagner, uh, an understanding of righteousness by faith that only her and her husband had actually shared. Right. She hadn't heard it from anyone else before. Correct. Yeah. So, so when Ellen White says in Christ Object Lessons 127, paragraph four, in every age, so that's not on your page, but I'm looking at it. Um, in every age, there is a new development of truth, a message of God to the people of that generation. The old truths are all essential. New truth is not independent of the old, but an unfolding of it. It is only as the old truths are understood that we can comprehend the new. When Christ desired to open to his disciples the truth of his resurrection, he began at Moses and all the prophets and expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. But it is the light which shines in the fresh unfolding of truth that glorifies the old. He who rejects or neglects the new does not really possess the old. For him, it loses its vital power and becomes but a lifeless form. And so when we think about new light and old night, old light, you can't just have new light and reject old. So when Ellen White says 
Uh, no human authority has any more right to change the location of these messages than to substitute the New Testament for the old. This is when somebody takes the, what we would call the new light and we, 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 we accept this, at least we think we are accepting it, but we actually reject the light that had come before. So when people substitute the New Testament for the old, um, they're really changing the location of these messages. They're, they're not appreciating the past. And, and, and so they have these misapprehensions about the past. So the Old Testament is the gospel in figures and symbols. The New Testament is the substance. So when we look at a progression of light and we have new light, it's making old light clearer. It doesn't do away with old light, but it brings something that she calls here the substance. And, and, I, and I'm going to equate that with righteousness or justification by faith is the third angel's message in verity. That's what she's saying here, that when you get to the end of it, when that light has unfolded, you now have something that is more substantial. She says one is as essential as the other. So just because the New Testament is the substance and the Old Testament has the gospels in figures and symbols, doesn't mean the New Testament is more essential. They're both essential. The Old Testament presents lessons from the lips of Christ. And these lessons have not lost their force in any particular. The first and second messages were given in 1843 and 1844, and we are now under the proclamation of the third. But all three messages are still to be proclaimed. It is just as essential now, so she uses this word essential again, as ever before that they shall be repeated to those who are seeking for the truth. By pen and voice, we are to sound the proclamation showing their order and the application of the prophecies that bring us to the third angel's message. There cannot be a third without a first and second. These messages we are to give to the world in publications, in discourses, showing in the line of prophetic history, the things that have been and the things that will be. And, and there is another statement in the spirit of prophecy, uh, which I always forget where it is, but where she talks about how as we pro pa pass over the ground of fulfilled prophecy, uh, those events will reflect back on events in the past. And those events in the past then will shine light forward on our path. So, so we can see how all of these things are essential, but that we don't fully understand the light of the past until we experience the fulfillment of prophecy. And then, and only then, are we going to have light for our feet ahead. Now, that would mean also that in, in trying to understand this, um, um, and we're going to look at this a little bit, but there is this sort of three-part thing. There's the past, the present, and the future that are all connected together. And, and you can see that there's three of them, uh, symbolizing in some ways the three angels' messages, but that the past, the present, and the future are all necessary in order for us to, to know where to go, to know where God is leading. Um, so, and any questions about this? I mean, I mean, this is pretty straightforward, but there may be something that somebody notices or a question they have regarding what we read in that paragraph. You know. <clears throat> okay, well, we'll read on here. So this is another statement that um, is going to talk about the first and second angels messages. So it says in like manner and here in early writing, she's comparing doubting Thomas uh, receiving the testimony of the disciples. Um, who had seen Christ. Those who have had no experience in the first and second angels' messages 
must receive them from others who had an experience and followed down through the messages. As Jesus was rejected, so I saw that these messages had been rejected. And as the disciples declared that there is salvation in no other name under heaven given among men, so also should the servants of God faithfully and fearlessly warn those who embrace but a part of the truths connected with the third message that they must gladly receive all the messages as God had given has given them or have no part in them in the matter so um so this is in early writing so this is you know obviously before 1888 this is um and and when she's talking about the third angel's message here we would know that um in, in this period of time this is when they're developing their understanding of the sabbath and the sunday issue but when she says that there are some who embrace but a part of the truths connected to the third angel's message um why is that according to this what we've read here why do some just embrace a, a but a part of the truths connected with the third message Because if they embraced all of the truth, they would have to come into a relationship with Christ and there would be things that would be required of them to surrender. And they want to hold on to those things that they don't wish to give up at this time. Okay. So, and, and experiencing those first and second angels messages, they haven't experienced them. So, if we try to put ourselves in that time, we could see there would be people who have heard about the Sabbath, right? Um, they may be, you know, are interested in Sabbath keeping and in some of these things, but they don't have a knowledge of Millerite history and often don't even have an interest in it. That is, and this is when I, when I became an Adventist, one of the things I noticed is that um, a lot of the older Adventists were really focused upon the idea that the Pope is the Antichrist and that Sunday is the mark of the beast. But they didn't, they little understood righteousness by faith. And, and I would like liken some of these, uh, these older Adventists that I knew who really had almost no interest in it because they, they had accepted that somehow because they believe that Saturday is the Sabbath and they know the Pope is the Antichrist, that was sufficient for them to know not to be deceived. And then, you know, other things connected with that. They knew the manner of Christ's coming. You know, he wasn't going to come in the secret chambers. And, and it seemed to be, and it seemed to me, that many of these people, their focus was really upon, and, and this is me, of course, judging people, but it was focused upon something that made them look better than others so that they 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 ha and, and the people who knew them that is the people in the community who knew them had the same feeling about them that is they just felt they were a bunch of self-righteous um adventists that they had no uh experience with christ and, and often they were very argumentative about uh, you know the Sabbath and different other issues that Adventists believe. So, so they weren't um, presenting a message that was attractive to the people around them. But, but that would be in part because their characters weren't very attractive. Now, again, you know, this is me judging other people, especially as a new Adventist, but that's the way that I saw it. Um, and that's the way other people saw it. So, so we would say that the problem here is that people embrace part of the message, you know, Saturday is the Sabbath, Sunday is the mark of the beast. And to them, that is the third angel's message, but they haven't appreciated what that experience means because they haven't experienced the first and second angel's messages. That is, they haven't experienced the gospel the everlasting gospel, this three-step testing prophetic message. 
Now, I also saw later that we had another manifestation um, to, to the other extreme. That is, when I became an Adventist in 1982, I mean, Glacier View hadn't been far away. Um, and there was this discussion regarding um, what Desmond Ford had taught. Now, there was a large group of Adventists who really felt that we needed to understand righteousness by faith. And as I read the various books uh, that I got from the ABC as a new Adventist, I recognized that um, they didn't understand righteousness by faith. One is uh, often they would contradict plain statements in the Bible and the spirit of prophecy regarding overcoming sin. And they would uh, leave out scriptures. They would take scriptures out of context because they wanted to them righteousness by faith was some kind of, uh, and to them that was the important thing, righteousness by faith. So they accepted the third angel's message as righteousness by faith. Um, but it was to me, I looked at it as kind of like magic. That is, they wanted to have this experience of righteousness by faith without actually experiencing righteousness by faith, if that makes sense. I don't know if anybody else has uh, any comments on what I'm saying, if they've saw the same type of thing in Adventism or whether they see it presently. Okay, so Gnostic beliefs about salvation. Uh, Chris Wright sounds like you're also talking about Gnostic beliefs. Um, Gnostic has a G instead of a K, but um, so what do you mean by Gnostic beliefs, Chris, Chris, about salvation? In other words, they're saved by what they know. Their knowledge will save them. Okay, yeah. So people believe that knowledge saves you. So, so it's not Gnosticism. You're just talking about Gnostic in the sense of knowledge. So, yes, and, and, and in a sense, both sides um, have, have the same opinion. That is, they think that if they know certain things, then that's going to affect their salvation. So a correct understanding of righteousness by faith is all that's needed and and for some that was just you know those other people are all legalists you know who are focused upon the sunday sabbath issue well in a sense they're they're no less legalistic than the others they just they're just another side of the same error another extreme and you know if you can't reveal christ's character and and neither group did um, in my experience as a new Adventist back then, um, I didn't see anything attractive about either group. That is, they weren't, um, I, I was getting no inspiration from them. In my study of the spirit of prophecy in the Bible, though, I got, I learned an awful lot. And um, so I abandoned the reading of the books from the ABC and I began reading the Bible and the Spirit of Prophecy because I found that the books and the ministers at camp meeting and all these things were presenting, um, they were presenting something that I wouldn't recognize as being the gospel. Now, I didn't understand it all that much, but I just knew that my experience that I was going through, that both of these groups, I could not relate to the experience that they appeared to have. So I, I didn't see that, you know, somehow being an Adventist was going to save me. I wasn't actually even interested in getting saved per se. I was interested in having a character that was changed to be like Christ. That was what I was interested in. And neither of these groups seemed that interested in it. They were, both were really in that sense, legalistic, but just in their own way. You know, and, and one of the ways I look at it is you have one group that might be legalistic in that they have some strict rules and beliefs uh, that you need to be saved. And the other group, maybe it's more liberal, uh, but they just create a standard that they can reach. So 
some legalism has a standard that's almost impossible to reach. Um, but some other forms of legalism just have a reachable standard, but it's still legalism in the sense that somehow I can see myself as righteous. And we're going we're to look at this as we go through these studies over the next few weeks, however long this takes, and we'll see what righteousness by faith really is. And what people want is, of course, righteousness by sight. They want to see themselves as righteous so that they don't have to exercise faith in God. <clears throat> um, now, this is some more from early writings. This is later on, page 237 and 238 here. As the churches refuse to receive the first angel's message. So this, of course, is referring to the Protestant churches. They rejected the light from heaven and fell from the favor of God. They trusted to their own strength and by opposing the first message, placed themselves where they could not see the light of the second angel's message. But the beloved of God who were oppressed accepted the message, Babylon is fallen and left the churches. So that's gonna be the second message. Now, so the first message here, why do people reject it? According to Sister White here. They trust in their own strength. Okay. They're self-righteous. So, okay. So was the first angel's message offering to them the gospel to trust in, in, in God? Yes. Yeah. So we can see that that's righteousness by faith. So what they rejected is righteousness by faith because they trusted in their own righteousness. So they didn't have faith in God, they had faith in themselves, in their understanding, in their position within the church, in their ministers. Um, and that's why they rejected the light of the first angel's message. Now they then also opposed the first angel's message, placing themselves so they could not see the light of the second angel's message. So as we have the second angel's message arriving on April 19th, 1844, these people ha aren't in a position to even appreciate that light. That is, they don't even receive that light. But the ones that they were oppressing these, the beloved of God, who were oppressed, they accepted the message, Babylon, Babylon has fallen, and left the churches, right? So this is, Ellen White showing this progression of what happens. Now, um, so she says then, near the close of the second angel's message, I saw a great light from heaven shining upon the people of God. The rays of this light seemed bright as the sun, and I heard the voices of angels crying, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Now, the characteristic of the second angel's message is it's a doubling, right? Babylon has fallen, has fallen. But it's also a doubling in the sense that there are two aspects to the message. So how would we characterize these aspects? Babylon has fallen, and behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. What is being demonstrated here in the second angel's message? Well, anybody who's catering to his or her own pride has the spirit of Babylon, which exalts itself above God. And Babylon needs to be fallen in us. And that needs to be, we need to recognize it as fallen nature. The epitome of fallen nature is expressed in Babylon, in the papacy, right? And then we can be worthy if we continue in faith and penitence to accept Jesus when he's coming. Okay. We we ready to receive him is what I mean, and he to receive us. Okay, so so we can see that you you can't just have the message, behold the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him, without the message Babylon is fallen. Right. So the Babylon is fallen, um, in a sense, is a natural result 
of accepting the first angel's message. That is, when you accept the first angel's message, there are going to be people who, re who reject it. And those people are then going to persecute you, right? And because of that persecution, they close their doors of their churches. They reject, uh, they mock those who experience the first disappointment. And those that continue will have to recognize that the first group has actually rejected the first angel's message. And that's why they can give the second angel's message, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Now, um, when we look then at the second part of the second angel's message, this great light from heaven shining upon the people, this is the message of the second angel, even though it's not the second angel's message, it's, it's from the parable of the ten virgins, but it is the second angel's message. And this is talking about the coming of the bride. So this is going to focus upon the end of the second angel's message, October 22nd, 1844, and the arrival of the third. Right? So, I mean, we could say in a sense that the third angel's message is tied to the second, but, but that's of course natural because the second angel's message is tied to the rejection of the first. And so now when we have this second angel's message, especially the second part of it, it's going to lead to um, people taking a message to meet the bridegroom, to be looking for Christ. And do they find him? Do people enter into that, that door and is the door shut behind them? Yes. Okay. Now, it's not going to be many, but we know that there is going to be a group in Millerite history who are going to receive the third angel's message. That is, they're going to enter into the marriage supper. Now, of course, we know that Jesus doesn't come back on October 22nd, 1844. But we know he comes in the sense he begins a work that is the Day of Atonement. And that's what they were predicting. Now, they expected the Day of Atonement to literally be a day. Now, at the very least, they should have thought it might be a year. Because a day is a year. But it's a day in a different kind of sense. It's not a day for a year. It's a period of time. It's the Day of Atonement. And it has a progression that occurs. And we know that if they had been faithful, if the majority of Adventists had continued faithful, that work could have been accomplished and Christ could have come before this. You know, it's one of those ifs that, of course, didn't happen. But it could have happened if God's people had accepted um, the, the third angel's message. But they didn't. They gave the proclamation of the second, but very few people accepted it once the end of it. So when the third came, we now had this, um, this other part of the message, which, which we'll look into is the third angel's message and what that means. But you can see how all of these are tied up with righteousness by faith. And, and those that enter into uh, the holy place with Christ enter by faith. That is, they don't actually enter, you know, Physically, they don't see Christ moving from the holy to the most holy, but they know it by faith. So Ellen White goes on to say, this was the midnight cry, which was to give power to the second angel's message. So the second angel's message is Babylon is fallen, but we could say, behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him, is the midnight cry, which is an empowerment of that, that second angel's message. Angels were sent from heaven to arouse the discouraged saints and prepare them for the great work before them. The most talented men, 
were not the first to receive this message. Angels were sent to the humble, devoted ones, and constrained them to raise the cry, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Those entrusted with the cry made haste, and in the power of the Holy Spirit sounded the message and aroused their discouraged brethren. This work did not stand in the wisdom and learning of men, but in the power of God, and his saints, who heard the cry, could not resist it. The most spiritual received this message first, and those who had formerly led in the work were the last to receive and help swell the cry. Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. So, so we can see the progression of this message, and we can see that all along, it's tied up with righteousness by faith. They're not just some dry messages about time prophecies. They actually are an experience that had to be experienced in order to receive the third angel's message. And even many of those who experienced these messages didn't necessarily receive the third angel's message. That is, there are many people who did not accept the Sabbath and the sanctuary truths, but who had experienced this message. William Miller being one of them. But, th but there were others, and, and even those that had experienced this message and had not accepted the third, they could still look back upon their experience and see that it was God that was leading them, even though they went off in different directions theologically. <clears throat> so, so this is going to be important as we, we go through um, uh, some of these illustrations that Ellen White has. Now, this one here from April 1st, 1890, I've referred to already. Um, she says, several have written to me, inquiring if the message of justification by faith is the third angel's message. And I have answered, it is the third angel's message in verity. The prophet declares, and after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. So she's going to quote this, and she's going to focus upon this glory. Brightness, glory, and power are to be connected with the third angel's message. And conviction will follow wherever it is preached in demonstration of the Spirit. How will any of our brethren know when this light shall come to the people of God? How will any of our brethren know when this light shall come to the people of God? As yet, we certainly have not seen the light that answers to this description. God is light for his people, and all who will accept it will see the sinfulness of remaining in a lukewarm condition. They will heed the counsel of the true witness when he says, Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Now notice this is 1890. So this is after 1888. And she says, we have not seen the light that answers to this description. So was there the pro proclamation of the third angel's message in 1888? Proclamation, yes. Yeah. But was it preached in demonstration of the spirit? Was the no. character, the glory of Christ seen upon his people? No, right? No. Not at so, all. Right. So, so this is a problem. You know, the third angel's message arrived on October 22nd, 1844. It continue, it unfolds, but certain aspects of the message are rejected even prior to 1888. That is, the first and second angel's messages are rejected. And so when the third angel's message comes, it can't actually accomplish it with its work. Right, so the third angel's message is going to need something, which we know she talks about in other places, that it needs to be joined by another angel, the angel of Revelation 18, in order to be empowered. And she likens Revelation 18 to the Sunday law. She connects the two together. 
But we know you can't just have the Sunday law pop out of nowhere. And, and if you just believe in righteousness by faith in the way that often people talk about it, you know, that you feel that you are saved or, or you have some kind of experience, um, whatever it is, you know, it's different for different people, what they believe righteousness by faith is. Some, for some, it's just understanding it theologically. Um, when the Sunday law comes, are you going to be ready? No. Because you need to do what? You wouldn't have the proper experience to be prepared. Right. So you don't have the experience. And the experience is not just the experience of the third, because you can't have the experience of the third without the experience of the first and second. So when people are urging upon you that we need to understand righteousness by faith, but they aren't concerned in understanding the first and second angels' messages, how would we take that? What does that mean? Do they have the third angel's message? Can't. Yeah, they can't, right? And they can talk about it all they want, and they can even get it right in the sense of they have the right words. You know, some people just read Jones and Wagner, and, and they will talk about righteousness by faith, just as Jones and Wagner did. But did Jones and Wagner reveal Christ's character in all that they did? No. Had they experienced the third angel's message in verity? They did not. Right. Wagner committed adultery, fell away from Adventism, had an excuse. If you read his deathbed confession, his last um, uh, confession. So that is his his witness, his um, it was found on his desk when he died. It's the last thing he wrote. Um, he's pretty much in the same boat as Desmond Ford. I mean, he rejected the twenty three hundred days and the investigative judgment. Now, Jones. Of course, he demonstrated a bit of an arrogant spirit and and um, thought of himself more highly than he ought to. And that was one of his falls. He, he trusted that he could reject um, counsel from the spirit of prophecy because he knew better. And of course, that was his downfall. And But I believe that Jones repented of that prior to his death, but it's not really that important what happened. Um, but one thing we do know is that Jones and Wagner, and, and also Prescott, who went around with Ellen White presenting righteousness by faith, these people were not changed. And so if you have the, the people who are leading out in giving a message and they're unchanged by that message, the question is why? And as Heidi has said, it's, it's the experience. But it's not just the experience of righteousness by faith. They have rejected the experience of the first and second angel's messages. And that's why they can't be benefited by the third. <clears throat> uh, now, this next statement, um, many of you will know uh, from nine testimonies. And... Uh, this is from 1904. Uh, I don't know why I didn't put the date on it here, but um, so this is in connection with the Nashville uh, vision. Um, so she, Ellen White says, in the visions of the night, a very impressive scene passed before me. I saw an immense ball of fire fall among some beautiful mansions, causing their instant destruction. I heard someone say, we knew that the judgments of God were coming upon the earth, but we did not know that they would come so soon. Others with agonized voices said, you knew? Why then did you not tell us? We did not know. On every side, I heard similar words of reproach spoken. In great distress, I awoke. I went to sleep again, and I seemed to be in a large gathering. One of authority was addressing the company before whom was spread out a map of the world. So those of you familiar with this, uh, where is she? Um, 
what is this about this uh, map thing? Um, where, where is she in this vision? Isn't she in Oakland at this time? Uh, I believe that this is in Tennessee, Nashville, Tennessee. Okay. And, and this map, so if you remember about the coordinates of Nashville and its connection to um, uh, Acts 27, um, there's a whole, whole connection that um, uh, Odilia went through back in 2019. But also the actual coordinates um, were found by, um, uh, well, I guess it was the two brothers there. Uh, so, Chuck Holmes, right? Yeah, we had Chuck. Chuck Holmes? Yeah, and his brother. Uh, Is it Robert? Robert? Yeah, Robert. So Rob and, and Chuck. So, so they had nailed down these coordinates, and it's, I'm not going to go into that part of it right now. But part of it had to do with this map of the world. So um, I spent a lot of time looking at the map um, and and finding these connections as well. So I'm not going to, you know, go into all that stuff dealing with the coordinates. And but, you know, they gave us coordinates that that were right on the steps of um, the, the uh, uh, Parthenon there in Nashville. So. So this had to do with this. So part of this had to do with this vision. But anyway, this is connected to the Nashville prediction. He said that the map pictured God's vineyard, which must be cultivated as light from heaven shone upon anyone. That one was to reflect the light to others. Lights were to be kindled in many places. And from these lights, still other lights were to be kindled. So one of the things we see here in this context of this Nashville vision and this map is that there is this, these lights that, that um, are kindled, right? So lamps, right? And, and they, they, you know, you light one lamp with another lamp, right? We wouldn't do that nowadays with lights. Um, but um, with those lights that they had then, these were lamps, uh, they would, this is how the light would spread. And then it says the words were repeated. Now, of course, we we don't see these words repeated as stated earlier, but so when she says they're repeated, um, would not this be that it it's happens twice? These words that are going to be said. I mean, maybe it's just repeated. She means repeated from the scriptures in the past, but. I take it as that this is a doubling. This is representing the midnight cry. So she quotes from Matthew 5, verse 13 to 16. Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing, but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid, and neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Now there's lots in this statement when we take this and we place it in the context that Ellen White does. Now, you know, she could just be saying, well, we have these lights and we, we need to shine. But she's, she's implying something more than that once we understand it in the context of this message. So what, what is it we see that's represented here? What kind of things are being represented? We have salt. We have this light. We have a city. We have a bushel, we have the candlestick itself. So what are these symbols?
Um, thinking of salt, I know that salt salt can preserve, and the Roman soldiers accepted salt as their salary. So it has some good qualities. But if you salt a city, you're destroying that city. You're making it sterile. So mm -hmm. everything has to be heated up with wisdom, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, so the so salt is... Um, it can be good or bad, I guess, in that sense. But but the idea that salt that's lost its savor. Now, I don't know if salt can really lose its flavor. I've heard people say it can. Um, uh, I don't know how it would do that. Um, maybe a certain type of salt, you know, some of the salt gets washed away or something. And I don't know. But salt is salt. I mean, it's not. Its flavor comes from the fact that it's salt, not from any sort of thing attached to it um, but maybe you know certain types of mineral salts or whatever can uh, have less flavor but anyway um, a salt has lost its savor so if we're the salt of the earth and we're supposed to uh, be a blessing a preservative but we lost we have lost our savor then obviously we can't salt anything we can't it, we're not going to benefit anyone now, in the context of what we've been talking about, the first, second, and third angels' messages, what is salt then in the, in, the, in the context of the lines? What would salt be? Would you say it's spreading the message? Okay, it's spreading the message, but wouldn't it be kind of be an empowerment of a message? Because if we have salt that, that doesn't have a savor, it's not good for anything. I mean, this would be, going back to what I was talking about my first experience as an Adventist, is basically my experience within Adventism was there was a, a bunch of people that were salt, but had no savor. They didn't have the character of Christ. They were, they had a form of godliness, but they denied the power of God. You know, again, it's me judging other people that I don't really know, but that was my experience. Uh, yeah, I, <laughs> I had a similar experience. You know, and I became one of those those folks after a while too. I'm sad to say, but you know, like the, Paul talks about a savor of life to life or death unto death, depends on how we handle or mishandle the word of God. Like the letter without the spirit kill us, and I think that would be like salt without a savor. It's not that the salt itself loses its savor or flavor; it's because we become without savor, without an appeal, without being attractive to other people by our attitudes sometimes. Yeah. So, so we know that this, this is sort of parallel to the Laodicean message. I mean, a church that is unconverted, um, I mean, it's candlestick it can be removed out of its place, which it's going to talk about a candlestick next, but it's trodden underfoot of men. Right. And then he says, you are the light of the world. But we know a city set on a hill cannot be hid. But men do not light a candle and put it under a bushel. But on a candlestick. So what does it mean to take a light and put it under a bushel? How would this represent our discussion here of for second and third angels messages? hidden light and we're not giving it okay so what is the bushel itself what is it that stops that light from shining us not giving the message okay not giving a message but also that light is shrouded by men's opinions and ideas See, men love the darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. In order for us to 
set this light on a candlestick, we would, we would have to actually let that light do its work in our lives. We would rather hide it, not because we're not hiding it necessarily from others, but we're hiding it from ourselves. That is, we don't want this message to actually affect the work that it was designed to do. So if you say, let your light shine before men, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. I mean, this is the third angel's message in verity, is it not? Amen. If they're glorifying the Father, then we're not asking for our own glory, because we're certainly worthy of none. Okay. Then she says, I saw jets of light shining from cities and villages. So, so we need to glorify God, but she's going to see something now. She sees jets of light shining from cities and villages and from the high places and the low places of the earth. God's word was obeyed, and as a result, there were memorials for him in every city and village. His truth was proclaimed throughout the world. Is this not the proclamation of the third angel's message with power that she's describing? So this is what was supposed to happen in Millerite history. So she sees this map, she sees all this light, but then it says, then this map was removed. So, so I believe that she's seen this light shining from these cities and villages on this map. That's how I picture it. So you have this table with this map, these men around it, and, and then you see these jets of light shining from cities and villages on this map. But now the map is removed and another is put in its place. On it, light was shining from a few places only. The rest of the world was in darkness with only a glimmer of light here and there. Our instructor said, this darkness is the result of men, men's following their own course. They have cherished hereditary and cultivated tendencies to evil. They have made questioning and fault finding and accusing the chief and, and accusing the chief business of their lives. Their hearts are not right with God. They have hidden their light under a bushel. So what is she describing here? Who is this that she's describing? This is in the context of the Nashville vision. So who is this? Those that are connected with the movement that have refused to give the message. Right. So we have this map where light was shining, right? From the villages and, and cities. But this map was removed. So what is this map? The world? Would it not be the world? It's, it's the world. And, and it's pictured God's vineyard, which must be cultivated, right? So, but this map would be connected to this message. Because if you remove this map, we had a message to give to the world, July 18, 2020. But after July 18, 2020, we remove that map. And we put this other map. We're very little light is shining and that's because men love darkness rather than light their own deeds are evil they are not willing to be changed and they can talk about things like you know eating two meals a day and not ever snacking there's all kinds of things they can talk about about overcoming sin in the context of what they say is righteousness by faith but they are actually under a deception because what are they doing? According to her, to, to Sister White, questioning, fault finding, 
and accusing, that that's the business of their lives. And this is talking about us, about this movement. So whatever we want to say about how righteous we are, even though we might disguise that in, in, in how we present it, when we are doing this work, which is basically the work of Satan, it's just the natural uh, hereditary and also cultivated tendencies that exist within us. If every soldier of Christ had done his duty, if every watchman on the walls of Zion had given the trumpet a certain sound, the world might ere this have heard the message of warning, but the work is years behind. While men have slept, Satan has stolen a march upon us. This is the problem because this is where we are at. That is, we, we say that we're in a movement that has a message but we're not doing anything and we're not doing anything. One is because we're fighting with each other, but also we haven't let this message do its work upon our hearts. We can't give the trumpet a certain sound if we're not reflecting Christ's character. And that's, that's you know, when I'm thinking about the, sorry, Theodore, I'm thinking about okay. that map and people gathered around it and there's a table. That's like a war room. And then she refers to soldiers. And that's what we need to be. We need to be soldiers who are willing to do the commands mm -hmm. of our general, our heavenly mm -hmm. general. And a lot of times we're not. I know I'm not, a, not always. I can't say I'm consistently willing to obey or even aware of what I'm supposed to obey. Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed. And, you know, the most disappointing thing about the July 18, 2020 prediction is not that Nashville wasn't hit by a fireball. For me, the greatest disappointment is the response of this movement after the failure of our prediction. Amen to that. And, and we should have been following the counsel that Ellen White gave us. And it was laid out for us to follow. Jeff laid it out prior to July 18th. But we ended up rejecting the very um, method of study that led to the July 18, 2020 prediction. And we rejected it. Because if we're going to accept July 18th, that is, if we use the proper method of study, we would just confirm that we were correct. But people didn't want to be correct. They wanted to find fault. And so they had to abandon the rules. They had to abandon the foundation that had led us to that prediction. And so now we had no message. But we know that this is going to be rectified that this work has to be accomplished because Christ has to return and that work that we see is this one the individual work but it's it's understanding and experiencing the message of righteousness by faith as we have moved through this these events as we have moved through prophecy now, I gave all of this as, as a preamble to two different um, uh, chapters from early writings. So the first one is the Advent Movement Illustrated. And uh, the second one is going to be another illustration. It's, I think that's just the title of it. Um, yeah, another illustration. So there's these two different representations of the, Miller, of the Millerite history. And, and it's interesting in that she used one that's much more symbolic. The first one is much more symbolic than the second. Um, so we're going to start on this uh, just a little bit. But I do want people to read through these over the next week. Because um, I would like to get through both of them, you know, by on, on next Friday. Uh, I might not, though, because um, other things might come up as we start to go through these studies. Um, 
but but let's read this at least some of this here because uh, we just have about 15 minutes about 13 minutes so we'll just get started on this Ellen White says i saw a number of companies that seemed to be bound together by cords many of these companies were in total darkness their eyes were directed downward to the earth and there seemed to be no connection between them and jesus but scattered through these different companies were persons whose countenances looked light and whose eyes were raised to heaven. Beams of light from Jesus, like rays from the sun, were imparted to them. An angel bade me look carefully, and I saw an angel watching over every one of those who had a ray of light, while evil angels surrounded those who were in darkness. I heard the voice of an angel cry, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. So what is this message? What are these people that are bound in cords? What, what time is this illustrating? Would that be at the Sunday law or after the Sunday law? Okay, so this would be because it's the first angel's message. Fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come. And Ellen White's illustrating the Advent movement. So this would be under the proclamation of the first angel's message. So we have these companies, which would be religions, denominations, whatever you want to, however you want to look at it. But they're bound together by cords. So what is it that has bound together these different denominations? What are these chords? It's not of God. It's of yeah. man. Isn't it? Yeah. So, so these would be man's doctrines and understanding of scripture. Right? These are what bound together different denominations. Whatever particular do denomination you are. You have some certain beliefs that bind you together right so we're seeing that all of these churches they're bound together by cords and 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 many of these churches are in total darkness they're focused upon the earth they, they have no connection between them and jesus but there are those that are scattered throughout these companies throughout these denominations people whose countenance looked light and whose eyes were raised to heaven because beams of light, truth, were coming to these people from Christ. And, and angels are, are watching over these ones who have this light. While the evil angels are surrounding those who are in darkness. And that's why we hear the voice of an angel cry, fear God and give glory to him. For the hour of his judgment is come. So this is the proclamation of the first angel's message. She then says, a glorious light then rested down upon these companies to enlighten all who would receive it. Some of those who were in darkness received the light and rejoiced. Others resisted the light from heaven, saying that it was sent to lead them astray. So remember, we have this idea with the paths and the way marks. So when new light comes, it, it, it gives light to our path, but some doubt it because it doesn't fit in with their thinking or understanding so that they think that this light, this new light is meant to lead them astray, to take them off the path. The light passed away from them and they were left in darkness. So when a person has light and they believe that it's going to lead them astray, that that's why it's there, that it's, they don't think it's true light, that light passes away from them, right? They now have made their choice, and they're going to go into darkness. Okay, so those who had received the light from Jesus joyfully cherished the increase of precious light, which was shed upon them. Their faces beamed with holy joy, while their gaze was directed upward to Jesus with intense interest, and their voices were heard in harmony with the voice of the angel, fear God and give glory to him, 
for the hour of his judgment has come. So they have accepted the first angel's message. And then they're going to give that message. As they raise this cry, I saw those who were in darkness thrusting them with side and with shoulder. Then many who cherished the sacred light broke the cords which confined them and stood out separated from those companies. As they were doing this, men belonging to the different companies and revered by them passed through some with pleasing words and others with wrathful looks and threatening gestures and fastened the cords which were weakening. These men were constantly saying, God is with us. We stand in the light. We have the truth. I inquired who these men were and was told they were the ministers and leading men who had rejected the light themselves and were unwilling that others should receive it. So we can see here, and I just wanted to do a little bit of that. So when we look at this, Ellen White's illustrating the first angel's message here, and she's going to illustrate the second as well. And you, you can see it starting here because people are going to be leaving these they're going to break these cords and leave these groups. But the ministers are going to come in and say, you know, we have the light. We, we have the truth. God is with us. But these are the ministers. Now, in our history, is this the experience that we see under the proclamation of the first angel's message from 1989 to 2001? I mean, we weren't, I wasn't there personally involved in what Jeff was doing. And we see, of course, this continues. But can we see the parallel? Isn't it kind of evident? Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty evident. And the ministers, of course, and, and even under the, the second angel's message in this movement, it's the ministers who are um, unwilling that others should receive light that they themselves had rejected. Now, I've always wondered about that. I don't know how many other people have, but what is it about people in general that when they, um, when they have rejected light, why do they care about the others? Like, we know they don't care about them, right? So, for instance, I mean, my friend Kelly, when he was disfellowshipped um, because of the 2520, um, you know, they gave all kinds of words about how this is the first step in the redemption process for you and all these kind of things, and we're going to be working for your salvation. Of course, once they disfellowshipped him, did they care at all? about about what was happening in his life were they doing anything redemptive and the, the answer is no but what is it that these men are doing why are they so intent upon controlling others why would they not in, instead um it's, it's kind of a, I don't know how to ask the question. Why is it that they're not allowing people to just examine the truth for themselves? They're not following the right spirit, so they're threatened by people following what they were accused. Okay, so so they're not following the light. So they're, they have a papal doctrine, right, as... Angela puts there. But we see that sometimes they're using pleasing words, right? So they're using flattery and all kinds of different things, manipulation. And, and sometimes it's wrathful looks and threatening gestures. I mean, I experienced that. Um, definitely. Um, so and I probably saw more of that than the pleasing words, though I did hear some of those too. But When people do not have the truth, when they reject the gospel, 
They have no power other than the power of deception, the power of force. They don't have the power of truth um, to help them or to aid them. That is, they rarely will spend the time to follow the counsel Ellen White gives. If a brother differ with you, right, you need to sit down, you need to study things out, you need to hear him out. You may be actually need, he may have light that you need, right? You don't know. And if you do this responsibly, um, then you're just doing your responsibility uh, that every minister should have. But one of the things we see when people reject light, we can see how they act. Have we seen this same attitude within this movement? After July 18th, even. Oh, boy. Yeah. Right. So, so we find that um, when light is rejected, it doesn't matter whether it's the first or the second angel's message, you're going to have this same uh, experience, the same manifestation. People who are binding others with cords, who do not want people to examine things for themselves. And, and this, of course, we cannot do. We have to. Remind, reminds me of a conversation I had with somebody last night. I had to tell this person that, yes, we are studying present truth and God is revealing marvelous things to us. <laughs> I mean, what a question to ask. Are, are, are Dwight and Theodore studying present truth? I said, <laughs> you have no idea how far we, you know, we're advancing because God is revealing amazing things to us. It was like, I hope it helped open this person's eyes somewhat. Well, and, and then when the pastor comes over and tells me, oh, I'm so glad that you're studying with Adventists. And I'm telling him about why I no longer go to church. You know, just, and then I'm, then I'm looking at him, I'm thinking, this man is at a crossroads. And he really needs to be prayed for that he may. And, I, and when I prayed with him, I said, I pray that Pastor Royce comes to know the truth fully i think those are almost my exact words and he thanked me and left and and the one thing is it's not going to come by argument right we it's going to come by the change that happens in our characters for those that are looking for light obviously those that those that have rejected light i mean they would crucify christ so, you know, it's not as if um, somehow if we are Christ-like that we're going to win them because they've already rejected light. But there are many who are looking for light. And it's those that are going to be drawn by the change that happens in our lives. So I just want to read this um, I'm going to read this paragraph, but I'm not going to comment on it. And then we'll close with prayer. Um, this is just finishing the thoughts that, that uh, she had here. I saw those who cherish the light looking upward with ardent desire, expecting Jesus to come and take them to himself. Soon a cloud passed over them and their faces were sorrowful. I inquired the cause of this cloud and was shown that it was their disappointment. The time when they expected their Savior had passed and Jesus had not come. As discouragement settled upon the waiting ones, the ministers and leading men, whom I had before noticed, rejoiced, and all those who had rejected the light triumphed greatly, while Satan and his evil angels also exalted. So you can see that's the end of the, the first angel's message, and we're going to come into the second angel's message. But you can see the contrast here between those who are looking for Christ and those who are rejecting light. And the question that we have to ask ourselves, are we really ardently desiring 
and expecting Jesus to come, to take us to himself? Are we really wanting to have this work done in our lives, to be changed? Or are we just wanting to see ourselves as better, better than others? That's really the question we have to ask. And it's the question we have to ask every day, but especially as light comes to us, if we feel ourselves resisting light, we have to ask ourselves, why? Why am I resistant? What is it I don't want to give up about myself? What is it I love about the world? What is it I love about sin? And so it's my prayer that people take this message, this first angel's message, and recognize that this is the beginning of the gospel. Light, men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. That is righteousness by faith. If you have not recognized this and you think you're better than others, you're of that class that rejected light. So let's close with prayer. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we are so thankful for your spirit that speaks to our heart, that convicts us of sin, righteousness, righteousness and judgment. We are thankful for the Sabbath that's coming. Uh, for some of us, it's already here, but we ask, Lord, that um, your presence can be with us throughout this day. Help us to learn of the meekness and lowliness of Christ, to learn in the school of Christ, to take up the yoke, which is the cross of Christ, and to be yoked with Christ, that we can receive his power and strength. Help us to forsake this world and all the things that are in it, and to always have your kingdom and your glory uh, before us. Thank you for your work of salvation and for the experience that we have had in our lives, that we can see ourselves truly as sinners and give us strength each day, Lord, to walk with you. Be with us in these studies each Friday evening and, and uh, next Sabbath in the afternoon as well, on the second and fourth Sabbath, when we have these studies in the afternoon as well. And I pray, Lord, that... Um, um, the work that has been unfinished can be taken up once again and that this movement can fulfill its commission. Forgive us for our sins and be with us now. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen.